All right. Good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to the August Rocky Mountain Railroad Club uh, general meeting. Uh, tonight's guest will be Bruce Barrett again with the second part in sort of a, a series of behind the scenes. Right. Good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to the August Rocky Mountain Railroad Club. I should not leave the YouTube stream live or live on another monitor. Really tends to uh, scare the crap out of me when I start talking to myself. Um, anyway, tonight will be the second in a very special series of programs from Mr. Bruce Barrett uh, on some of the inside behind the scenes bits of how railroads interoperate with each other, uh, things that we don't often get to hear about. So this is going to be an extremely uh, special program and hopefully interesting to most of you. Um, as usual, during the program, we'll keep everyone muted. Uh, Bruce has said he's fine taking questions at the end. So once we get to the end of the program, we'll open it up for you all. But until then, um, I'm gonna turn it over to our president and vice president for news and announcements. Go ahead, Denny. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the August meeting via the um, internet again and uh, welcome Bruce looking forward to your program and, and for some reason I'm seeing John who's our special long range member nice to see you and I gotta say hi to Wally because I enjoy the uh, webmasters work um, on our uh, on our page uh, Rocky Mountain Railroad Club page and all of the um, pictures that get posted and I'll, I'll make a uh, I even got a couple on there you know, if, if you see something that's kind of interesting and, and different, you know, send it to Wally because it's really cool to pick up as people travel around the state, the various railroad happenings. So um, I think that's been a good thing that we've gotten and, and maintained and everything. Um, obviously, and I, I have to say, we have some, uh, an upcoming Como event on Sunday um, in August and uh we're not quite sure everybody's got the uh, rail report. So we're not quite sure what the steam engine is going to be, but we're going to plan to be there. I'll be there. And I think it'll be a good time, uh, even if it's hand car. So keep posted. Uh, those that are on internet, will be able to get to, um, and um, we'll, we'll see how it works out. But, but the last word was that, that they may have it going, but uh, Como is always a joy to, to be at in our historical foundations, given a lot of money up there. And, and uh, so anyway, I hope I uh, get to see some of you up there and there's hey, other Danny. steam around and, and uh, hopefully uh, some of you, I'm going to make it, I think to Antonito to see some of the steam down there um, uh, on that Cumbria special and, and uh, hope some other people can make that. Um, the other thing I, I kind of had was if anybody knows of, any shows opening back up again or uh, things we should participate in or things of interest, uh, let Bruce now or Dave or me know um, so we can publish this stuff uh, coming off of the, um, uh, the pandemic. Uh, um, things are opening up at different paces and uh, yeah, thanks Dave. Um, and uh, so anyway, I just uh, make a pitch. If you know anything, uh, write a quick text or an email or whatever. Um, so, uh, it's good to be here tonight. Uh, we do have some news potentially about the church and I think we should share a bit, but Dave kind of was driving that. So I will, uh, turn that over to him and some other announcements as, as well as, uh, the, our speaker introduction. So hey, good to Dave, be with y'all tonight. Before you start, I got a note from Pat that says he has an update on Como. So I figured this oh, might be a good Adam. place to put that in. Pat, would you like to give us an update? Um, not, nothing too exciting, but it, it looks so far like the cylinder head will be reproduced. We'll get it back together. Um, so, you know, this thing should be running, but, you know, keep in mind there's plenty of other uh, activities to, right. uh, for railroad day anyway, before our trip on Sunday, uh, you know, we'll still be able to uh, view some of the other uh Museum at the depot, the the new pits, for example, that are uh, coming into play, and so there's lots to see. Also, besides, even if Kate somehow doesn't run, but so far sounding good. All right. So, Pat, is the water tank going up? 
they started it, I think. They How had cool. a groundbreaking for it. How cool. That was uh, the 24th. So, yeah. So, and they also uh, put up the uh, scale house. This guy did uh -huh. that. So, lots of new things to see. All right. Indeed. Thanks. thanks for the update, Pat. Looking forward sure. to it. Yeah, thanks. See everyone. So uh, for those of you that don't know exactly what all uh, Denny and Pat were talking about, that uh, refers to August the 21st. It's the annual Boreas Pass Railroad Day in Como, Colorado. And the club is planning to do an event on Sunday the 22nd. Uh, that way we're not uh, getting in the way of, of their events. And uh, as Denny said, we will, uh, we will ride around the yards on some sort of rail vehicle that's running. If the steam engine's not running, I think there's a pump car and maybe a small uh, motor car. So that is uh, in your bulletin for those of you that are members of the Rocky Mountain Railroad Club. Um, <clears throat> also, Denny uh, mentioned briefly, I, I had a uh, little talk yesterday with the uh, guy who's sort of the building administrator at the church where we've had our meeting hall meetings for many decades. And it's looking like there's a chance that we might get to actually get back in person in September uh, and I know many of you, like uh, John Scott, want to know that we could stream this even if we're meeting in person. We don't want to overpromise yet. We're uh, still figuring out if we have the, the technology and the people and the cameras to do all this. But uh, if we don't get that all happening for September and we do meet in person, then we will try and get it down the road. I think once we start to meet in person again, our first priority will make sure that the shows work in person, and then we'll try to get it out to the rest of you as best and as soon as we can. But uh, it's a new world. We're just gonna have to uh, walk our way through it gently. Um, other new things, uh, the uh, Westside Lumber Company, Shea number eight that ran up at the loop many years ago and has been parked at Canyon City for several years on display, I guess has been bought by the Moffett Road Railroad Museum in Granby and is going to be moving up there. I don't have many details. Uh, this was kind of a surprise to a lot of us, but uh, more power to them. I know the, the folks up there in Granby are actually have some, some pretty big plans for a lot of things and improvements on their museum. I, I was up that way about a year ago and spoke with Dave Naples and uh, he showed me some pretty ambitious plans for, for things yeah. they're gonna do up there. Also, uh, I was very fortunate on July 24th to be invited down to Albuquerque when the, uh, the folks that have been working on uh, Al Atchison, Topeka, and Santa Fe 2926 got to steam up that big 484 and uh, run it under its own steam for the first time since probably December of 1953. That is a really pretty engine and, you know, late late technology, 1944 roller bearings. Um, when they can get that worked out to get some permission to run that on the line, uh, they have just a few hundred feet of track to run it back and forth on an industrial spur right now. But the guys in the cab said that engine really wants to run. So that'll be <laughs> something to see. It's really something to see. I mean, just a huge engine. I think they're claiming that it might be a little bit bigger than the 844, possibly the largest operating northern in uh, in the U.S., which may beat anywhere else, don't know. Um, yes, I don't. I'm sure there's other things that I'm forgetting. Uh, usually, like when we're in person, we have a few people jump up from the back of the room and give us some announcements of, of new things. Most of you probably know that the Big Boy 4014 is out on the road. Uh, I believe somewhere still in Nebraska today headed towards eventually Houston, New Orleans, and then uh, coming back through Denver and getting back to Cheyenne first week of September. And uh, also a lot of people are familiar with the fact that there's a lot of big doings coming down to the uh, Coombers and Toltec with their Victorian steam specials. Um, a lot, of, was it four or five engines? Bill Kepner probably knows this. Four or five engines that are pre-1900 uh, and some uh, antique rolling stock. It's going to be quite the deal. I, I happened to, since I was down in Albuquerque, I came back through Chama and they ran the 168 over Coombers Pass and into Chama 
probably the first time it had been over the past since it was put in the park in Colorado Springs in about 1938, I think. So a lot of, lot of momentous occasions are happening this summer. Um, I think uh, I, can, I can quit yapping now and introduce uh, Bruce Barrett and let you uh, hear some more about uh, how operating agreements work between uh, a couple of railroads and, and uh, how these things get hammered out and arm wrestled. Uh, Bruce, would you like to jump in here? He's finding his mute switch. Ah, there we go. Thank you. There he is. Dave, Denny, Nathan, thank you very much for uh, the invitation to come back and share with you again. It's always a pleasure to get to do that. Um, without further ado, let's uh, take a step into, uh, Nathan, could I have screen sharing back, please? So we'll uh, take a step back into the real railroad career. And, okay, um, the program is uh, the second in the series of the behind the scenes. And this one is to take a look at agreements for operating with another railroad. As you noticed on the title slide, there was a BNSF locomotive on the head end and a whole bunch of locomotives of different colors in the background. And so we're gonna get into that towards the end of the show that all of those uh, are there and it takes agreements to make all of that happen. So how does all of this come together in the real world? So those of us that are model railroaders, those of us that are armchair uh, railroaders, um, some of us uh, may not understand what all it takes to make the one-to-one -one railroad get up and go. So as we take a look at this, uh, let me give you a little bit of the background, those of you that may not have been with me last time. I've been a so locomotive engineer for Santa Fe for 20 years, and I also worked on Santa Fe special projects, including bringing BN and Santa Fe together. I was the assistant uh, superintendent for management in Topeka, Kansas for a while, and then I got into the trackage rights, which is what we did last uh, meeting, and in, that was in May. And we talked a lot about trackage rights and I was in charge of 6,300 miles of railroad on um, BNSF on UP. And I was the liaison between BNSF and UP at the Harriman Center, which was always fun. As I said last time, you have a bullseye painted on both sides of your head. And so you uh, are always in the firing line and somebody is always unhappy with you. Then I went to joint facilities for my last eight years where I, uh, took care of writing, negotiating, and administering agreements. I also took care of all system detours, locomotive uh, agreements, uh, use agreements, run through detours, and shall we say duties as otherwise assigned, which kept me quite busy. As an engineer, I got to run on two continents. Here we have on the left-hand side, picture of me uh, running Denver to Pueblo in a Kodachrome. On the right-hand side, I was very fortunate to be able to go down and run on the New South Wales Railway uh, on a vacation, but I also was there to uh, do some air brake instructing uh, for some guys out there. Uh, the general road foreman uh, was uh, wanted to know more about uh, braking systems and uh, things on the American Railroad, so I got to run freight, passenger, and express service down there, and that was that was a real great highlight. Well, without further ado, let's take a look at agreements. What is involved in agreement negotiation? Well, this graphic that you see pretty well explains the whole nine yards. You don't have any idea where you're starting. You don't have any idea where you're going. And you only hope that and pray that you can get there. So as you get into talks with the other railroad, you know what your goals might be, and then you uh, learn very quickly what their goals might be, but how do you meet in the middle? And that takes a very circuitous route, sometimes many, many years. 
I worked on one agreement uh, in my last assignment there, uh, my eight years in Fort Worth at Joint Facilities, where I took over negotiating an agreement with a railroad, which we shall remain nameless because I'm still under an NDA. And, but uh, there were uh, two gentlemen ahead of me that were working on that agreement, and I handed it off to the person that took my job. So four people, and I have no clue if that agreement has ever been consummated or not. So sometimes it moves at glacial speed. So you ask many questions, and you get questions back in the negotiating process. And you have many, many people that are uh, tagging on your coattails asking, hey, we want this special interest. We want that. And you, you have to negotiate this into the agreement. So you do the best you can to get everything of your company's items into the agreement. Well, brand X over there on the other side of the table is doing the exact same thing. So as we work through those things, we find out that a very small percentage of those things are compatible and the rest of it comes out in negotiation. So let's, now we know kind of the basics of negotiating in the agreements. We're going to take a look at different types of agreements, what joint facilities really is. And we will also come into some of the fun stories uh, as to why this does and does not work. So interpretation is the other side of this piece. As you want to negotiate, I'm sorry, interpret the agreement your way to the advantage of your company. They want to do it uh, in the like manner to it, the advantation of brand X. So here you have the same type of freeway construction which is mesmerizing in the least. And then we try to figure it out in the end. What are joint facilities? The definition of the joint facilities, uh, at least in the BNSF world is the one we use. Railroad assets, resources, transportation services that are shared by two or more railroads, such as trackage, equipment, buildings, or other facilities, switching operations, and employees. All of these things can be worked together. And uh, if you think about all of those, what really is not included that is involved in the railroad in real life? Absolutely nothing. So anything can become a joint facility. Again, joint facilities, that's used by two railroads and everybody has their thoughts as to what is that and how should it work for their company. Types of joint facilities. We looked at trackage rights agreements last time, and that's the right to operate trains on foreign railroads and trackage with its own crews. Rates are covered by maintenance, dispatching, and ownership expenses. Keep in mind, those can be uh, mandated by the STB or uh, in history, Interstate Commerce Commission. They can be mutually agreed upon for each other's advantage. And they can be something that is uh, a overhead rights only, which means you can go from point A to point B and do nothing in between, or you can have rights to uh, businesses and industries along that way. We'll kind of get into that a little later. Haulage agreements. Hmm, this is where one road, which owns the track, handles foreign cars and traffic, for the other railroad and typically in the same train as the owner's traffic. Sometimes that can be legislated uh, in uh, by the STB or ICC, but those are rare occurrences in my experience. We have interchange agreements. Those identify the use of property and trackage in taking cars from point A or train A and company A and delivering them to company B to further on to the destination. That may happen two or three times between the origin and destination points for a specific car. And those agreements always talk about uh, operating parameters, how far can you go, uh, how far you shouldn't go, and if you go beyond that, 
uh, there's liability issues. If you go on the ground or tear something up when you are in interchange service, that also spells out the liabilities. Switching contracts, one carrier providing switching services for another carrier at a terminal where company B does not have their own facilities. So we'll talk a little bit more about that as well. Crossing and interlocking agreements, uh, that can be an absolute nat, uh, rat's nest. Normally on a crossing and interchange agreement, the company that lays their track there first or graded the right of way first is the boss of the crossing and interlocking agreement. So we'll delve into that a little bit, but that's where two railroads cross. Those of you in the Denver area might think of Sand Creek Crossing, something like that, uh, and uh, or going north of uh, the uh, uh, Rennick Yard going across where BNSF crosses the UP up there. Those are crossing agreements, and that has a lot of uh, stipulations to that. Uh, Senior Road being the one that laid their track in that location first, the uh, Junior Road being uh, Johnny come lately. Detour agreements, and that's where we put the framework out when things go bump in the night or you get a flood, et cetera, going on. Um, detour agreements, and we'll go into the myriad types of those later on tonight. Uh, it's usually done on very, very short notice of, oh my gosh, I went on the ground. Hey, Railroad B, can we run a train over your area? And you got to get their permission. You don't just show up on the doorstep and say, hello, I'm here. I'm going to run my train. Uh, it also happens in planned rerouting, such as maintenance outages. A um, key example of that is the Tehachapi Pass um, maintenance uh, that we did back in the um, late uh, 1990s, early 2000s. We'd shut Tehachapi down for an entire evening or 24 or 36 hours, we had to find ways to get trains around because UPS people still wanted to get their their uh, uh, their vans. Other types of, of joint facilities, locomotive agreements, and that's where we get into our title slide uh, as to what happens with those locomotives. How can we uh, get them on other railroads and make those very colorful lash-ups? Uh, how's that happen? And also run through is a very close cousin to use agreements. Usually those are done with short line railroads. Track leases, uh, where railroad A has track in an area at railroad B wants to use some of that. Could be a short line or it could be class one wants to use track on a short line railroad. So how do we make that happen? Uh, and so we'll talk a little bit about that. BNSF, well, let's go trackage rights. You saw this in the trackage rights uh, presentation last time. BNSF has uh, 8,000 miles where BNSF is on a foreign carrier, 5,000 miles where foreign carriers are on BNSF. And uh, that's where the bullseye was painted on both sides of my head. I was in charge of 6,300 miles of us on them. And, uh, you know, Chief Cook and Bottle Walker, Washer. So, um, there were very many short nights and uh, uh, sometimes, uh, I think my longest day was about 70, 72 hours. Uh, and that was mostly due to Feather River Canyon outages where we had buku problems and trying to get things to move. Trackage rights, we won't spend much time here. Those of you that uh, were with us last time, we uh, looked through many uh, portions of this. If you didn't get an opportunity to look at that, YouTube's got it still, it's in the uh, May meeting. Here we have a photograph of uh, trackage rights. How did CNS get uh, down from Denver to Pueblo? It was trackage rights over the Santa Fe and then after 1936, uh, it was trackage rights on both the Santa Fe and Rio Grande. So when NHRS ran as special, Ed Fulcomer had a great picture of this train at Pueblo Union Depot. Santa Fe locomotives ran cars on the NHS special. It ran to Canyon City. And at that time, Santa Fe did not have track of their own to Canyon City due to some flooding in the 1930s. So 
we were on trackage rights on the Rio Grande. So just a perfect example of, oh, we need to get something done. This agreement supports it. Well, Pueblo has a perfect maze of trackage rights. All the different colors you see on this map, black is the only normal trackage that is here. All of the colors are the different agreements, which uh, unfortunately I managed and would give many classes on to executives that wanted to know, hey, how does Colorado work or how does Pueblo work? Many times uh, came out here with executives and would drive them around and explain the agreements and how. And boy, you really had to know your onions on all the agreements. What are the liabilities? What's the rates? What are our advantages and disadvantages? How can we make that an advantage for your own railroad to operate on? So also you need to know what other railroads cannot do across you. And uh, I'll give you a hint. We ran into that um, here about uh, three weeks ago. And even though I'm retired, I had to get involved in it. So anyway, we won't talk much about that. Uh, haulage agreements. And that's where we have the owning road handling foreign carriers traffic. So if you look at this photograph, this was the one of the title photographs for trackage rights. Well, it fit in both directions for both haulage and trackage rights. Who's on who here? And that's where you have to know what your rights are and who has haulage where. The track, uh, the train on the right is on trackage rights. The train on the left is haulage right. So those cars that are in the background were interchanged to the BNSF at Mormon Yard, and those are going to be hauled at uh, across the BNSF to another location where they will be spotted for the customer. The haulage agreement lays out rates and liabilities. Again, what happens? What are the volumes that can be uh, run? What uh, are the interchange points? How does it work? And in some cases, and in many cases now, we try to negotiate performance to each of these haulage agreements because each railroad has been historically stung by, okay, well, we've got this haulage agreement. Why do I need to take your cars in favor of my cars or with my cars to customer A, B, and C? So there we have to fight. That's where we get into the negotiation uh, of what the agreement means, what's the interpretation, and sometimes that gets boiled all the way up to and including the Surface Transportation Board, which I had to take several times and argued in front of the Surface Transportation Board. Uh, I think I only, in my career, I only lost once with that. So it's really pays to know your agreements. Interchange agreements. And uh, here we have similar things uh, with when our cars interchange and it identifies the property. It, uh, we have to very carefully draw out the exhibits of where on company B's trackage can company A come and interchange their uh, cars. Uh, what are the operating parameters? The sometimes um, there's times built into that that was true at 38th Street in uh, Denver for a time when uh, we interchanged from the North Yard. Uh, they interchanged twice a day for that. So we had uh, parameters because there were timed trains that they needed to get on uh, certain trains. And so we negotiated that into the agreement. Also, what happens when you go onto the ground? Uh, let's take the picture uh, in front of us. And let's say 556, um, this train is actually uh, going from the B end to the Frisco at the time, prior to the Frisco merger. These guys are on Frisco track. If that hopper in back of the two engine goes on the ground and makes a mess, who pays for it? And how much do they pay for it? So this is where railroads can gold plate an agreement and say, oh, whatever it costs, you guys get to pay for it. That gets to be a real challenge in uh, your budgeting process, which uh, joint facility teams are responsible for. You have a budget, you need to live within your budget. 
And if when you go outside the budget, your CEO wants to know why that trickles all the way down to your boss, your AVP, whoever it is, they want to know, okay, what happened here? Why are you two million and six out of your budget for this month? And uh, those are never fun agreement uh, or fun answers to have to explain to somebody who's unhappy about it. And Joe Blackwell, a uh, great photographer from Palmer Lake, uh, loaned me this image. And here we have an uh, interchange uh, with CN and uh, BNSF. Okay, you get to guess whose track is whose. So if you really don't know where you're at, or pull out your DeLorem or the SPB Atlas. Boy, how do you know where the track is? Take some place like Houston, where you have the spaghetti bowl of trackage and understanding where the interchanges are, at what track you can use to get there, uh, how those agreements work can be a real, real time crunch to learn all of those pieces. And as we look at those, we uh, have to school the new train masters. We have to school the superintendents because they'll say, oh, we just need to go here. We've got to get this done and we're going to, and you get to explain to them why you can't do that. Uh, and so being from an operating background uh, in, uh, I was very well respected at BNSF. And uh, so I could chat with uh, everybody up through, including the CEO, and explain those things uh, sometime in very warm and uncomfortable conversations. But uh, you know, I could explain those things and I got known for being able to do those things. And it was enjoyable uh, to know the agreements well enough to get a phone call at two o'clock in the morning and somebody wants to, to argue these and you can pull the facts out at two o'clock in the morning and tell them, okay, this is what the agreement says and this is what we can and can't do or go tell Railroad A to go pound sand because yes, we can do that. So it's uh, a lot of fun uh, sometimes. And so in my working career, you kind of had to find fun where you could. And uh, sometimes it was fun to rub salt in the wound, but we won't go there. Switching contracts. Switching contracts are where uh, one railroad doesn't have the facilities or it's more convenient to not build a facility and allow, allow another railroad to do the switching for you. Let's take, for example, the uh, agreement uh, between CNS and Santa Fe. 1900 was the uh, effective date of that agreement. And it established the... Uh, not only the trackage rights on Santa Fe, and this is again before the joint line was formed with Rio Grande, but CNS had some real bad problems. They were uh, at a very circuitous route and it was subject to flooding and damage and tight curves and very poorly laid out. Um, and uh, that's why they called it the crooked and slow uh, is the moniker. So the 1900 agreement was written to let uh, the two railroads operate together. It was a perfect example of a, a joint facility. So in Pueblo, which this picture from Larry Green shows, uh, was a joint facility where you saw on the tower for many, many years, uh, Santa Fe and CNS on the tower. And even though you saw Santa Fe engines uh, working the yard, uh, the crews really never knew what cars were Santa Fe, what cars were CNS. We switched whatever train came in and we would spot the customers and that was all taken care of by joint facility accounting people in the background. And even up in Denver where Santa Fe was uh, not uh, having a great deal of success in the 1880s, 1890s, in building into Denver. In fact, they were stopped by the ICC at one point. Um, though they made the agreement with CNS where they would go in from South Denver, their little fledgling yard in South Denver, and the switch engines were lettered CNS on the top because that's the ownership. You see the cb q style paint scheme, but CNS Santa Fe on the old 151 here. Uh, 
uh, this guy's work in Rice Yard. And as we look at those, that kind of identified, and so the bean counters, if there was a problem or fuel or anything, that all helped come through as the cost accounting for the joint facility itself. Well, modern day, switching contracts are still in vogue. Santa Fe, BNSF merges, UP and uh, WP merge, uh, SP merge, and so BNSF gets rights across the central quarter, Denver all the way to Oakland and Stockton. We talked about this in the last group. Well, we needed somebody to help us in the uh, Salt Lake City, Ogden area. Oh, well, who's there? So we knocked on the door at Utah Railway. They've got a facility. They have rights from, uh, from the Provo area uh, to go several directions. And most of those are south. They had no rights north. So it took us uh, about five months to negotiate with the Union Pacific in doing Mother May I of can we use the Utah Railway as our agent. And after they said yes, and we signed a dotted line there, then we negotiated with the Utah Railway a switching contract where they provided switching services for BNSF on a per car basis. And uh, then it turned into a per start basis. And then it reverted back to something else that I can't talk about at this point. So at any rate, um, that's a, this guy is working in a, a joint served yard in Clearfield, Utah. Utah engines, BNSF actually is the job. This is the uh, 613 job and uh, called out a Provo, runs up here, does switching, goes back to Provo, of course. And uh, so using Utah railway engines, which are now painted green or correction, uh, orange and black for uh, the good old uh, new orange cancer instead of the yellow cancer. So Genesee and Wyoming, Wyoming has taken over a lot of short lines. But uh, I worked uh, a great deal with them, spent a lot of time working with the Utah Railway, managing the day-to-day -day operations out there, the switching contracts, the budgeting, um, and uh, the pipeline for cars coming in, how did we not flood the yard, et cetera. So a lot of things to learn and understand with those switching contracts. So your joint facility teams learns those, and then they have to teach as the um, operating people go through the revolving door. Uh, you get to teach the new folks and uh, let them be mindful so that one railroad doesn't take advantage of the other one specifically. Uh, another carrier that is not your own paycheck carrier. Crossing and interlocking agreements. Here we have the, um, uh, the Heartland Flyer going from Fort Worth up to Oklahoma City. And he's crossing uh, the diamond. And these guys are, uh, he's actually crossing the former Rock Island, which is now UP. And uh, so this is the Duncan sub, and this guy is on the uh, uh, the Wichita Falls sub, and then he'll line over and, and go up to Fort Worth sub as we realign some trackage. If you look in the background towards the uh, grain elevator, that's actually the Fort Worth sub there, and I'll put my cursor back over there. It's the little dark spot at the base of the uh, grain elevator. And so it was just a lot easier to bring him out through Tower 60 and up this track uh, and then cross him over to Lake Wanda and let him head up Fort Worth Sub. But how do the interlocking agreements work? Again, the first guy to arrive is the senior road and they get to call all the shots. And uh, the junior road, the second one to arrive, gets to pay all of the expense of the crossing diamond signaling, dispatching, uh, the old interlocking towers. And the uh, junior road can be very well disadvantaged unless there's a good negotiator 
uh, that takes uh, at heart what is necessary for these. So as you go through the time that old railroads just had crossing gates or uh, flagging crossings and there were no signaling systems, then when signaling systems came into vogue, how do you do the accounting for these? And those are called uh, switch points or control points, uh, which is not what you think as far as switches, but these are the relays that end up back inside uh, a tower or the rods that happen in the old Armstrong towers. So those are all counted. And then you go through the next iteration of going to the dispatcher in another area. And now we have signaling systems where you count the number of relays that are in the signaling boxes, which are on the left and right of this picture. And those have to be accounted for. The junior road gets to pay for all of that and the maintenance thereof, and also part of the dispatcher's salary. Well, how, what percentage of the dispatcher's salary does it take this guy to push a button and allow the Heartland Flyer to go through? Well, you'd be surprised at the percentage of the salary for that particular dispatcher to include the payroll, the payroll associated costs, retirement, and everything else that goes in there that you have to pay to allow the Heartland Flyer or another train to roll over that territory. And those get into nasty interpretations and renegotiations. And usually the senior road says, you hear here a second time, you wanted to cross, tough, pay up or pull the diamond. And in today's railroading, what are you gonna do? Build a multi-million dollar overpass or something. And man, we just don't wanna do that. So long story short, bring out your checkbook. Well, take a look at this. How would you like to write the agreements for this, eh? Well, this is not in the United States. This I took in Melbourne, Australia. But can you imagine trying to write the Armstrong Tower Agreement for going through the tracks that go from the center of the picture on bottom over to the left-hand side over there? count all the switches, count the rods that would be in there. That's the complexity that it can take in some place like Houston or Kansas City or Chicago, Los Angeles. And so you go out and you have to understand the track structure. You have to understand where your property lines are and where you want to be, how you want to get there as we negotiate these agreements. So it's not as simple as you may think. You folks that are model railroaders, well, it's not bad to pay forty switch, forty dollars a switch for a new Pico switch to make this thing happen, or eighty dollars for a uh, you know the one of the switches that uh, uh, are multi multi direction switches. But man, the cost involved for these today in today's dollars in CTC can be mind boggling. And we have to deal with all of those in the joint facilities world. Uh, it, uh, it becomes interesting and it sure keeps you awake. Sometimes it keeps you awake at night trying to figure this stuff out. Well, what happens when things go bump in the night? Uh, Dan Munson, dear friend of mine, uh, train master, uh, correction, a yard master now in Kansas City, uh, was the uh, assistant superintendent in Omaha during the 2011 floods. And uh, as the flood on the Missouri River continued to get worse and worse, what do we do? How do we make this happen? And we started detouring trains all across the country. Just heroic efforts by people to uh, build reroutes, to rebuild trackage, and to make trains move. And uh, the side note, I ended up being part of that, still being a qualified locomotive engineer and designated supervisor of locomotive engineers. I got called out to Colorado to uh, actually re-qualify and then uh, pilot crews and uh, qualify other road foremen on the territories so that uh, we could continue to run trains during this flooding. 
So all of those pieces uh, have to be accounted for. It happens in service interruptions, whether it's a derailment or a flood. Um, it can be uh, service outages, such as a planned reroute for maintenance work. Those things all happen. And the detour agreements are not negotiated individually. We uh, negotiated those out uh, in, in language that would allow us to set up the framework to allow things to happen wherever it is on the railroad. But we had to get the mother may I from the railroad that owned the track and who had the crews to go ahead and run those trains. But the costs, the liabilities, all of those things are uh, placed into the agreement down to and including toilet paper rolls and paper towels and water bottles. So we had to bring all of those things into the agreements as we looked at those. And it took people with operating backgrounds to understand what does it take to uh, get uh, a crew supply with not only diesel fuel, but other things to make the train trip happen on the other person's railroad. And then you get to pay for all of that as well. So those things are all in the detour agreements. And then we have a sub agreement that is very, very quickly negotiated. Um, and many times uh, the paperwork happens after the detour starts because it happens. Don't my phone rang two o'clock in the morning. Oh my goodness, we're on the ground. Uh, what do we do? Where will people or UP allow us to go? We need to go over Canterra Loop. And I could tell them right off the bat, need to switch your trains in Barstow. If you're going to do a Barstow Pasco, here's the horsepower per ton you need. Here's the train makeup you need. You need a heavy head end. You can't have uh, this many tons. And this is what you're going to have to do to go through Canterra Loop. And then in the morning, you paper up the, uh, the agreement with Union Pacific's joint facility team. We uh, initial it, take it up to the ABP. He signs it and we're done. That all is the paperwork that has to happen in the background to make things happen. So the host road has the, the key and they can tell you no, but remember when that happens, that there are paybacks. And, re, and I will tell you, we have long memories. My nose may be long and it may turn gray, but it's like an elephant when it comes to the fact that Union Pacific told us no, and I've got a uh, UPS Z train sitting at uh, uh, Bakersfield, and we need to go up the coastline with this. And UP says, nope, I'm not going to let you go today. And then they have uh, something that goes on the ground in, on the Cotton Rock, and they want to knock on the door at Kansas City. And we give them the fickle finger fate award and tell them, remember this and stick your you know, hat in this one because you're not going to get to go. And as I was in Omaha uh, as trackage rights manager, I'd get these phone calls. And I also handled all the detours up there. So I would go down to their general superintendent and uh, he would leave me a note on my desk and say, hey, we need a detour here. And I would very kindly flip the note over. And uh, I would write on the back of it, uh, just Dennis, remember when, lovingly, Bruce. And I would go stick it on his desk during his conference call. And I would get a visit by the CEO of the Union Pacific going, what are you doing? We got to run these trains. And I go, remember the note that I just gave to Dennis Shackelford? Remember when? The answer is no. And they would call uh, the... Uh, um, at that point, uh, Krebs or um, the CEO and yell and scream, and I'd already have made the phone call, and they'd say, thank you, Bruce, we appreciate that, and they would listen to the phone call, and the CEO of the Union Pacific, ranting and raving, he'd go, what Bruce tell you? <laughs> and it was like, have a good day, click, and think about, remember this, next time we need to detour a UPS train. So there's strategic approvals, there's strategic denials, but you have to remember there are paybacks. They are expensive to do. 
uh, because you pay per mile for these puppies. And uh, it's, so if you're running a, a UPS train, even though they may only be 3,000 tons, you're going to pay through the nose for that puppy to go. And you're going to pay all the crews, all the payroll associated costs that go with that and part of their retirement. And it's going to be gold plated and heaven help you if that train hits an automobile or goes on the ground. So that is a tough thing to do. And we honestly think about those things before we run those trains. And it happens that your train is out on a detour and it hits a school bus full of nuns. Now, what do you do? And you quickly go up to the law department and say, fasten your feet belt, the seat belt, because we got a problem. And you take up the agreement, highlight it in the liability section, and everybody thinks, oh no, it happened on their railroad. We aren't responsible. Oh yes, you are. Locomotive agreements. And that goes back to the lead title slide that we had. Oh my goodness, how do you get all those wonderful, colorful locomotives in the consist? Because there we had NS, we had CSX, we had uh, BNSF all represented. Why are those locomotives in Inchita, Wyoming on a train headed up to Pasco? My goodness, we got to figure all of that out. Well, that's a, those are the locomotive agreements. There's two types of those animals. One is a locomotive run-through agreement, and the other one is a use agreement. So let's talk about run-throughs first. That's where it's more convenient to leave the power on the train when we interchange a train between two railroads and let the power run round trip. Here we have a Kansas City Power and Light train that is uh, given to us at Northport, and we run the power uh, through on both ends. BNSF power runs through to Kansas City on UP tracks. The UP power runs through to the coal fields and then back again. You have to delineate what happens with horsepower hours. That's one horsepower for one hour, whether the engine works or not. And then those have to be paid back. The second piece of that is what do you do with the diesel fuel? Third piece of that is the liability. Oh my goodness, you got a UP engine on the point and you hit that school bus up there at Crawford. Now, what do you do? That's all lined out in the liability pieces. And very, very, let's just put it simply. The liability sticks with the railroad on which the uh, locomotive is. So UP engine strikes an automobile or a bus at Crawford, Nebraska, BNSF, it's their responsibility for all the liability, all the injuries, and to repair the locomotive. That took a lot of my time. And uh, some of you uh, uh, may have seen things uh, of on YouTube of a auto accident with a train somewhere. And then uh, you know the phone rings at my desk and goes, since I had all the locomotive use and liability agreements. Oh, we just got to have a wreck over in uh, on the NS. Uh, what's the liability? And then I get to put on my suit three years later and go sit in a courtroom and present the agreement. And the lawyer asks, uh, would you read this section of the agreement? And um, I read it and the judge looks at me and says, you're excused. And then you know, the, the plaintiffs have no recourse to BNSF, but that was my job to protect BNSF interest with a BNSF engine on a leader NS, and we hit and did damage to persons in those cars. So understanding your agreement is very key, and the colorful lash-ups are really fun to look at, but I'll tell you what, there's a whole lot of paperwork that goes behind that. Here we have a picture on uh, uh, Curtis Hill, and you've got uh, UP NS engines and a BNSF leader. Those are on, locomotives are on horsepower hour payback. So when a BNSF engine goes over on a foreign railroad, this case UP and S NS, they have to pay us back with operable horsepower hour locomotives. And we get to use them any way we see fit as we uh, work those horsepower hours down. 
that was also one of my deals. I worked together with the uh, vice president of locomotives and uh, he had a staff of people that kept track of the locomotive hours. And then I got to write the nice nasty letters. Let's uh, say one to a railroad north um, of our border. Uh, they had a large number of horsepower hours that had accrued, uh, by the way, their paint scheme is black and uh, red with a kind of a worm, white worm emblem. And uh, they exceeded their number. So I sent them a demand for a check for $6.9 million and it said payable tomorrow. And because they refused to give us the locomotives and we put them on notice several times. And I was very happy to be able to lay that $6.9 million check on the vice president's desk with an apology note from Canadian National. So that was a fun time. And like I said, you, you get your fun where you can on this time. Locomotive use agreements. Normally we put those together with short line railroads that want to use our locomotives. Very, very rarely will you find uh, where we put a, an agreement together to use a short line locomotive on a class one railroad. Because many times they've got a GP7 or a CF7 or something. Last thing we wanna do is put that puppy out there on the main line and have it fail where we're still gonna have to, to account for that thing and pay for it. So we write locomotive use agreements to allow our larger locomotives to deliver a train, go to uh, a destination, and then it's written usually into the marketing agreement as to how those locomotives are uh, paid for. So the joint facilities team works very closely with A, the locomotive team, and B, the marketing team when they are negotiating rates on new business. And that took up a good deal of my time in uh, the joint facilities team to run through those things and remind new marketing people that, well, you got to pay for this locomotive some way. I mean, we're paying $2.6 million a copy for a C-44. Now, what are we, how are we going to pay for this when they keep it over there for six weeks and use it as a switcher? And so we have to write those agreements very, very carefully. Track leases. Typically, it's long-term storage or storage, uh, staging a train somewhere. Um, we've got excess cars. What do we do? Texas uh, Northwestern is, uh, has a huge facility and many, many railroads pay uh, track leases or storage for cars. Um, and the track leases become joint facility agreements. And uh, TNW leases uh, us trackage in the Edder, Texas area. And we use it to store excess cars instead of paying the per day uh, car storage fees that can become fairly uh, exorbitant over time. Track leases can be uh, very short. We also use these to service customers in certain areas. We did that on the central corridor where we needed headroom uh, to store cars for a customer or something. I would negotiate uh, a, an agreement with the Union Pacific to be able to use this piece of track for X number of dollars per month or year and we would use it for a designated purpose. That leads us to differences and disagreements. How does that happen? Well, it's very easy, but there's also the payback and there's the fun with that. As we have those differences, there's many, many times that you can play with the opponent's mind and you negotiate them and you walk them into a blind alley if you're a good negotiator. And I used to do that fairly well. And that was fun. And I would get involved in other areas and uh, I'd get to know the, what was going on. And they'd bring me in to uh, effectively walk somebody into a blind alley. And then you just very kindly close the door and slide the piece of paper across the desk and initial this. And that's the interpretation of the agreement. There's quite a few times that I was not very successful at that either, especially in my early years. But you learn and you very, very well learn that there's going to be differences, there's going to be disagreements. How do you work through those? And you try to make sure 
that you place your company in the greatest advantage you can as you look through these pieces. So as we've looked at what joint facilities are, what the different types of them are, I really hope that, that you have enjoyed part of this, you've learned a little bit of that, and that there's some rabbits to chase right now, and I would like to open that up to your questions. I'll try to answer those the best I can, and if I don't know, I'm not going to give you a snowball answer. All right, then. Um, I've allowed you to unmute yourself, so if you've got questions for Bruce, go ahead and unmute, ask your question, then go back on mute when you're done, if you would, please. Hey, Bruce, it's Wally Wirt, and I seem to remember my son telling me he, have to, he has a notebook binder because he works for the CNN Interchange Service, where you can go, what you can do, and why you can't. Okay, what type of finder, Wally? A uh, notebook binder for the Chicago Terminal District. Uh, those uh, are technology that was developed uh, pretty much um, in uh, my latter years, and we drew maps uh, for our territory, Chicago, uh, and uh, uh, the lady there, Kim, uh, drew a lot of maps for the team up there and uh, as to where you can go and what your rights are. And uh, the uh, GIS team would allow uh, you to put your cursor over a specific track and it would open up the agreement for you. And I'll tell you what, we spent hours and hours and hours putting the information together in the back office and putting those together. My territory was not Chicago, so I can't speak specifically for that, Molly, but I did develop those for the Denver uh, and the uh, Salt Lake area for the Kansas City, North Kansas City area, Omaha, uh, Albuquerque, Denver, uh, a lot of the areas where, the, where my facility were, because we had six joint facility managers and each one of us took that to heart to build those. So those are excellent tools for the field people. In fact, they gave Ray a uh, tablet. And uh, you're right. He touches the track and all kinds of information pop up. Right. And it can be done from tablets. We now have it for cell phones. Um, and But it's really hard to see on a cell phone. That application, I think, has been refined in the last two years. But initially, uh, we had it for only desktop computers, and then uh, IT rolled it back out uh, again for the tablet technology. One last comment on the short lines I worked for, uh, we interchanged with class ones. Uh, that was fun. You're on mute, Molly. When some of the short lines I worked for, we obviously interchanged with class ones. That got to be very interesting about we had one with a Eastern road whose locomotives are black and um, we could only go so far on this track. And if we went too far, then they yelled at us. Absolutely. So. That's uh, if you remember back to that, uh, our talk on the interchange, we specifically gave limits and many of those are in feet, not cars. Uh, I, in my latter years, tried to negotiate them as the clearance point of switch X and or uh, five engine links past the point of the switch that we needed to throw to be able to go back to our river. So uh, you're right, Wally. Uh, and we negotiated some that were outlandish, 5,713.2 feet past this. There ain't no way that you're going to be able to tell a crew where you're 1,327.2 feet past something in the Nevada desert. But I had to negotiate one of those agreements with a short line railroad. And you know, it was not a fun deal. So and by the way, I hate those plane rides out of Elko. Yuck. Anyway, other questions? Wally, thank you very much. Good questions. Oh, yeah, I just wanted to comment uh, that was all very interesting. I appreciated how you uh, pointed out how the 
original history of the railroads rolls into the trackage and all that too. But uh, for example, the one uh, the caboose we have in Bailey was um, labeled both C and S and had Burlington Route Herald on it. So that was uh, I like seeing the tower there that you had the picture with both of them on there. Yeah, and absolutely the uh, the joint facility people need to understand the heritage of this. I cannot stress that strongly enough. Uh, we had a set of SPV atlases uh, at our desks so that we could really quickly reference where the trackage is and really who was the predecessor road. Because you pull out of your file cabinet that the uh, Denver and New Orleans had a, an agreement with uh -huh. the uh, um, Chicago or the uh, Colorado Midland at some place. Oh, okay. Now, how do you know whose railroad that is today? How do you figure right. that out? Well, you got, you know, it may take you three days to figure that out, and you still have people knocking on the door asking for things, and you've got to figure this out for a liability or something that happened or an agreement that you are going to write. So we uh, really needed to know our onions as to who had rights where, what that railroad was, what all of the names of that railroad have been in history. And many of us would have cheat sheets on the inside of our, uh, uh, our covered doors as to this is the liturgy, the liturgy of the railroads. And most of the class one railroads have it on their websites now. As uh -huh. the railroad became, this railroad became, this railroad became, this railroad. And then you have to think about the receivership, where actually, if you look back at CNS, it was uh, controlled by Gould in the UP at one point. Right, yeah. Oh, well, duh. Now you got an ag agreement with UP, UP. When was that crossing agreement? Or when was that crossing laid? Who owned the railroad at that time? Did UP cross UP? So uh, okay. there's another story with this on the joint line. Let's say Fountain uh, uh -huh. is, is here. And we had flyovers where the Santa Fe flew over the uh, Rio Grande and then during the USRA time frame, USA, USRA took out all, all those flyovers and they gave the railroads back in 1922 and said, here you go, guys, but if we ever have to use the railroads again, you're not putting the flyovers back in, figure it out. And oh. so that led to the 1936 agreement where the joint line from South Denver to Bragdon was uh, negotiated and finally signed. Think about it, 1922 to 1936, how many things can go wrong in that time period? So, uh -huh. but let's focus at Fountain. Okay, we're gonna put in Duckworth Crossing now, and we are going to uh, have a new crossing put in there. And who's gonna write the crossing agreement? So I got a knock on my door by Jeff Grinnell from the UP. And um, Jeff said, uh, we need to write a crossing agreement and uh, since the Santa Fe track is on the west side and the tracks on the east side, who's going to maintain the crossing signals and the gates and how are we going to proportion those costs? Uh -huh. And I just had a little fun with Jeff and I said, go back and, and think about the last tour I gave you on the joint line. We were sitting at that crossing and I explained something to you. I'll give you 15 minutes and I'll call you back. And I hung up. <laughs> went to get a cup of coffee and I called Jeff back and I said, well, did you learn anything? And he said, yeah, I own both sides of the track right here. I said, yep, <laughs> I'm not going to sign any agreement. It's your track. Have a good day. Yeah. You own the ground. <laughs> yep. We, had, we were flying over you at that point and both railroad tracks are yours. Have a good day. Enjoy the cost of both sides of the crossing. <laughs> it's kind of the fun part you get to have with people 
And I had a great relationship with Jeff. Let me uh, tell you, he is probably the sharpest of the UP negotiators. And you know, he ate my lunch several times. And so there's times that I got to have a little bit of fun with him. But for the most part, he ate my lunch most of the time in negotiations. He's a master at it. Jeff's now retired. And uh, we were great friends over the years. I worked with him for 16 years. This is Andrew, wow. I have a question. What happens to agreements when railroads merge and something like the joint line where the Colorado and Southern is part of BNSF, so it's sort of like agreeing with, it, with itself? Mm -hmm. Does the old agreement become moot? That is the easiest answer to tell you. Yes. Right. We have to be very, very careful with those, with the rights and the, and the things, but you don't want to forget whose predecessor is where because that affects <clears throat> other agreements and with, that may have been written with the Rio Grande now UP. So those things you have to really keep in mind as a joint facility person, but the uh, like the 1900 agreement became absolutely moot because right. it was Santa Fe, CNS merged now into BNSO. And so we go through and we uh, go through a process, a deep dive into our database and look at those agreements. And then we file the appropriate agreement uh, cancellation documents with the surface transportation board now and that can be a very lengthy and time-consuming process but yeah you're right good question again you're talking about locomotives and usage uh we i worked for milwaukee and back in the 70s we were in financial difficulties we would have a the erie lackawanna before the conrail uh uh, to take over of the Erie, they would bring in a train every day and we'd send a train back to the Erie <clears throat> the one day. And it was typ typically the engines would lay over 12 to 18 hours. So one day a ABBA set of E units came in uh, off the Erie on the transfer and the Milwaukee being power short, uh, he said, oh, we're going to pull a fast one. So they grabbed these four units and sent them to Savannah, Illinois on a, on a road freight and uh, the, the, uh, then there was a derailment and they got held over and the uh, Erie was less than impressed. That is a great story, Ron, because that happens much more than you think. Oh, we're going to borrow those units and they're never going to know. Well, that's also why we have AEI scanners that uh, we access and ask the railroads for and get them through uh, the... Uh, American Association of Railroads and the, um, that uh, is you know, stuff that we know that we use to hold their feet to the fire. Many times, you know, I'd have a use locomotive use agreement or an interchange agreement, um, a power agreement, and you can have these units in your yard for just the exact same thing, Ron, of an interchange and we're going to bring them back tomorrow. You cannot take them and run them to Savannah, Illinois. Have a good day. I mean, there's, there's diesel fuel that has to be accounted for. There's liabilities. And when they're out there, what happens? And if there's a problem. So that happens a lot uh, when a sly smart operator decides they're going to borrow some locomotives. Um, let me go back to one other thing here. Uh, since we're saying that, um, we had a train that was um, running the central quarter, a BNSF train that would, had proper horsepower westbound to make their pickup at Pernley and then would uh, make Daughter Pass. And uh, I showed up in my office at 5 a.m. and sitting on my desk was the uh, general superintendent of the Western Lines for UP when I was in Omaha. And he said, we got your train uh, with not enough horsepower uh, stuck on Donner Pass and we got Amtrak behind him. What are you gonna do? And why'd you do this? And I said, eh, 
let's take a look. I mean, look at the AEI scanner, and I said, hey, where's UP uh, 3687? That was on that train out of Provo, and I showed him the AEI scanner out of Provo, out of Salt Lake City. He was missing when he's out of Elko, El and I said, where's that, where's that locomotive? That's your horsepower that's missing. Let's go visit the quarter manager down in the bunker. So we walked down there and Emily Friend was the quarter manager and she said, that's a UP engine. I needed power. So I took that engine off that train and I just looked at Dennis and I said, have a good day. You better figure out a way you're going to get that train over Donner Pass and you're going to eat the time on, on Amtrak. Ain't my fault. And boy, did when I left the bunker, you could hear this buzzsaw that was going through that young lady's britches. But anyway... You, you, got, you gotta love it. Yep. You'd mentioned the Denver New Orleans, um, and that also became Colorado and Southern later on. Right. Uh, but would that also have been the same 1900? What I thought it was like in 1900, 1910 mm -hmm. that ATSF bought. CNS, right? Mm, well, not bought. Um, now, the merger, not the merger, but the trackage rights agreement in 1900 uh, was yeah. South Denver to Bragdon only, and that, that was just trackage rights. It also was 19 pages long in uh, delineating how you use crews and uh, crew rights with those pieces, um, and that was a very complicated web. Uh, Larry Green has done a marvelous amount of research, uh, digging apart the old agreements and finding documents of actually locomotive engineers that were transferred uh, to the Joint Seniority District. And it's just been fascinating to read Larry's um, uh, information that he's been able to dig up. I will tell you one thing with the uh, that happened with that if the CNS crews chose to uh -huh. go with the CNS Santa Fe agreement, they lost all rights and go flow back if traffic decreased. And then when those persons resigned or passed away or retired, those positions were filled with uh, Santa Fe employees to where ultimately that's where my seniority started in 1974 was Denver to Pueblo. And we were, captive we could not go to Wahona we couldn't go anywhere else all we had was Denver uh, to Pueblo and Pueblo Yard because of the 1900 agreement Denver to where what yard Denver to Pueblo oh okay that was my seniority district I see not until 1984 when we got uh, system seniority on the conductors did I get my brakeman seniority back but I it didn't flow back to 1974 so, mm, okay. Um, Interesting. Thank you. Another question on that on that district. How did that work when Colorado and Southern and Santa Fe hooked their passenger trains together sometime in the 50s? Mm. And then Colorado and Southern ended service, but Santa Fe had to continue until Amtrak. Yep, that's true. The so, so who who was in the who was in the locomotive? It could be a Santa Fe crew uh, or it could be a CNS crew, just like uh, when it was um, my uh, time, I got called out of Denver. Um, I would get called with uh, BN power. Or I'd get called with Santa Fe power. It made no difference to me. It all paid the same. Uh, so in passenger service, it's a bid job. And there were a certain proportion of CNS guys in the passenger pool and a certain number of CNS guys in the passenger pool, they would uh, run again, Denver to Pueblo only. In the later years, that got kind of expanded uh, a bit and I am not sure, I'm not extremely clear because it was before my time. Uh, I'd have to go back and le read Larry's massive research that he's done as to how the passenger trains were crewed uh, up until the 1950s and 
when uh, the Texas uh, Zephyr was discontinued uh, in the 60s. So I really, I can't answer that with clarity. Now, Santa Fe Cruz, uh, when 191-100, uh, I'm sorry, 190-191, 200-201 were running, after CNS departed, it was Santa Fe only cruise. And they did run Denver to Lahana under a special agreement. So you said that, so the cruise went all the way through. They didn't, they didn't, uh, they didn't switch crews in Pueblo. That is correct. Yeah, there was a special uh, agreement um, called a run through, uh, crew run through agreement. And we also did the same thing when we had Q train service. Um, we uh, had a proportional pool where, if I remember right, we had four joint line crews to uh, two Lahana crews because of mileage. And then every think five weeks, four and a half, five weeks, we would take out a joint line crew and add a um, a Lahana crew to run off the mileage. And we, uh, the local chairman kept very close track of that and managed those pools. Other questions? Very good questions. Thank you, gentlemen. Uh, thank you. Uh, I really enjoyed it. Thank you. Thank you, Ron. As always, it was very informative. It's a pleasure to you. It makes me glad that I didn't have to operate in a lot of those agreements. The few that I had were such a pain in the ass. <laughs> you bet. I still have band-aids that I haven't been able to pull off from my uh, my working days. We had we had the same thing. Uh, uh, Portage up to Minneapolis, uh, St. Paul. Uh, when the Sioux took over to Milwaukee, they brought Sioux line people over. Uh, that was a problem. And then they, uh, we ran over two to two, there was a inter, interdivisional run. And so there was a, there was more mileage on the river sub than there was between Port, uh, Portage and La Crosse. And so there was, there was a, doing the same thing, keeping track of the mileage so that they would stick an extra crew in every once in a while out of the cities to, uh, to even things out that, that on when you're working out of Portage, uh, uh, as a Milwaukee man, it was a it was a pain. It was very, yeah, you could take it in the shorts financially sometimes. Yes. Yeah, I have one more question uh, to do with this issue of, of emergency rerouting, having to have pilots on on trains. Don't at least at West. Don't the two large class ones basically operate on the same rule book? And the only thing they would not know specifically is, you know, the speed limits and all those sorts of things on the lines themselves. But the, the rules under, don't they use the same rule book? Like the Northeast. It's similar. Let me put it that way. Um, the general code of operating rules has amendments. And you have superintendent's notices, you have uh, signal differences that are put out under uh, superintendent's notices. Um, and a, a pilot on a detour train will, under BNSF rules, will run the train. And that is also true at UP. So the crew of the train can sit back and watch, but they are not allowed to, to run the throttle. And that's a liability issue. So the rule book uh, very, very clearly states that a train that is detouring will be handled by the owner of the rails. And that's as of the last rule book that I had to take a test on in 2013. Yeah. Uh, let me ask a question on that. If, the, if you have a, a knuckle drawbar train separation, the, the owning train still has to perform the work to put it back together. Uh, they, don't, they don't use a uh, pilot 
crew to fix it, do they? Uh, in short answer to that is yes, because if there is a crew injury, lifting up the drawbar or the knuckle or getting a sprained ankle, that is a huge liability uh, of, because the railroad that owns the track would say, they did it on their own. It's in the rule book. They're not supposed to be out there doing anything. And the uh, railroad that has the train goes, well, we did that to make things more fluid for you. And that's where those disagreements and interpretations happen. And if one of my crews would have done that, um, I would have had a probably a very short, stern talk with them to read the rule book. You were not supposed to do anything, stay in the cab. Okay, um, thank, thanks. That, that answered the part, question. We don't use those unless they're a very short um, district and we just want to leave our crew on there. And the job briefing with the uh, train master, dispatcher, the manager will tell them uh, get out of the, the engineer, get out of the seat, and everybody go to the second unit. Have a good day. Because if you run over a school bus full of kids, we don't want you guys up front. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Thanks a lot. Let's clean mm -hmm. your own. Good Bruce, you just amazed me with the uh, knowledge that you have. <laughs> Not only are they complicated, but the ability to uh, recall all that uh, pleasure to listen to you. Thank you, Denny. It's a, it's always good stuff. Thanks, Wally. Look forward to seeing you on the 20th. I'll be there. Well, thanks again, Bruce. Uh, another, uh, an in, another insider bit that we wouldn't get from most people. Yeah. Uh, thanks for taking the questions. Um, our next program, our next meeting will be September the 14th. Um, I guess we will talk this over amongst the board and we will let everybody know via the newsletter whether this is, uh, hey, if you guys would mute yourselves, that'd be great. Uh, we'll let you know via the mute newsletter if this will be in person at the church. Um, right. I think there's there's a good chance and I know a lot of people are eager to do that. Um one thing the, the church building administrator guy told me is that they really are hoping that uh, people that come to these meetings, especially since it's a non-church group, that they would be vaccinated. Um, and uh, if we do have these meetings and you're not vaccinated, then they would, would really suggest strongly that you wear a mask. So Amen. these are all the things we're working through. Um, you know, that's for the, for the good of everybody. And I realize everybody has their personal preferences, but I guess we try to think of taking care of the group as a whole. So, uh, uh, all right, we will, we will let you know what the plan is for September. Brian Bechtold will be our presenter. He will do uh, a few shorter, uh, still photo programs instead of one, uh, one theme topic, it'll be uh, a few different shorts, but, uh, Brian Bechtold has been nice enough to agree to do that. And uh, <clears throat> we'll see what happens for October, November. There's, <clears throat> with all these uh, goings on down there, uh, like I said, in narrow gauge world, we might be able to get a program from one of the guys involved with, uh, with that. Like, for instance, maybe John Bush. Um, and I know some of these guys have said they would prefer to do their programs in person. So we will see. <clears throat> and uh, typically in October, we would have our club banquet uh, we're not planning to do that this year. We, we did get to have the triple steam picnic out at the railroad museum at golden in May. That sort of took the place of the banquet for this year. Uh, we will see if uh, maybe there can be a banquet next year. And, uh, unless Denny or Nathan has something else, I think we're just about done. Yeah. I'd like to remind everybody the 22nd and Como and, um, for the Rocky, uh, Ride, hopefully the twenty first. So you're not confused. Is the Boris Pass days? Boris. That's when. That's when the band will be there in the Roundhouse. But uh, we'll have our own uh, our own train the next day, and 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 uh, should be pretty interesting. And also, uh, everybody that's on, uh, there will be a board meeting next Monday. Uh, that'll be a Zoom meeting still at uh, at six thirty. So I've got. And, uh, 
Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Denny. No. Um, any other questions, comments? I've got one other thing. If Mr. Uh, Kepner out there would like to uh, plug something the friends are doing during this Victorian Iron Horse Roundup, for those of you who can't make it down to Narrow Gauge World, uh, the friends are putting on something very unique that will allow you to at least participate partially virtually. So, Bill? Okay, is there a website on that? or? Hold on, I'm hoping Bill will, you're muted, Bill. I was double muted. Um, you hear me now? Yep. Okay, um, partially through the inspiration of the Rocky Club and being able to do the uh, combined Zoom and YouTube live uh, sessions, we are going to attempt to do a Friends of the CNTS meeting or members meeting on the 26th at 6 p.m. And members of the Friends will get a Zoom link. Uh, we're also publishing a uh, YouTube link. And let me see if I can find that. Uh, I've got it for you, Bill. I'll throw it in the chat. Okay. Anyway, what we're going to do is we're going to try and solicit some videos from various people that have uh, been on uh, some of the runs prior to that in the week, and maybe some images, maybe some uh, personal stories, and I'm hoping we can get some interviews on some of the key players. And we're also building up a, a little bit of a Wi-Fi network in the Antito Yard so that we can actually uh, have a uh, probably a uh, Wi-Fi connected person close to the uh, depot so that when a train comes in at 7 p.m. we'll be able to broadcast that live. So those are the kind of things we're thinking about doing. Uh, don't know if anybody's ever done something like this before sort of live and but we'll see how it goes. Sounds great. Thanks. Yeah. Thank you. Nathan. Um, sure. Um, I happened to see that on NGDF and wanted to make sure that uh, we let our members know about it because it's a it's a pretty unique opportunity, especially for those people who won't make it down. I, I, I've got one more thing to add. Um, 50 years ago, this Labor Day weekend, the Rocky Club ran uh, two charters, uh, one in a Cumbers and one in Durango and Silverton. And uh, that I was on that, and then the Labor Day weekend, we drove from my brother's place in Boulder back to Chicago, and it'll be exactly 50 years today. I'm driving from Oakley, Kansas, back to Chicago. <laughs> so uh, it's um, things, whatever. Marvelous. <laughs> yeah. five. It seems like only yesterday. Indeed. I was on that trip uh, from uh, the uh, the two trips, uh, Labor Day weekend, 1971. I was there, too. Nice. <laughs> small, small world. Yeah, yeah it was uh, a, lot of, a lot of miles ago. First yeah. time I ever saw Narrow Gauge. Yeah, uh, same here. Gauge. Same here. Well, thank you again, Bruce, very much. And uh, I think we'll... Uh, conclude the uh, the evening at this point yep thank you all uh hopefully we'll be able to bring you brian next month if we do meet in person hopefully we'll be able to do it virtually i'm working out the details but i've got two weeks in narrow gauge country and a bunch of other things going on so bear with us if it's a little rough next month <laughs> see you down okay. there nathan thanks again good night everyone good night. Okay. Good night. good night thanks all good right night. you bet. Bye-bye.